see it's time for a poor people's campaign and a national call for a moral revival. If you gonna get together, somebody say yes. Amen. This is an extraordinary privilege for the St. Mark's community to be hosting Dr. William Barber. I say doctor, he's reverend, he's doctor, he's recently been consecrated as a bishop, so you can, you know, you pay your money and you take your choice. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, he needs no introduction. Amen. <laughs> What I want to say about this guy who's seated behind me is that um, he is a unique voice at the moment. He's giving expression to something that we're not hearing and, and we're starved of it. Uh, we have heard so much immoral talk. We have so, heard so much talk that is, has no moral content in it at all. To hear a clear, moral, Christian voice is such a breath of fresh air. And I see Senator Holly Mitchell down here <laughs> nodding away. So you know his story, you know about Moral Mondays, you know about all the work he's done with the NAACP and so on and so forth. Uh, you've seen him on CNN and on MSNBC. Uh, what I love is his really sharp, critical analysis with that very passionate Christian moral voice blended in. And it's wonderful. Reverend Barber, it's wonderful that you're here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Wow. So if we might, gracious God, we thank you so much for the gift of life, the gift of serving, the gift of your spirit. We know that whenever you call any of us to say anything in your name, you take a risk of putting that which is frail, that which is great, that which is a treasure into frail human beings. So tonight we live in no delusions. We need your help always. Once again, surprise us and somehow use lips of clay to speak words of life. The words of our mouth, the meditation of our heart might be acceptable in the nice sight. Come, Spirit, come. Amen. Amen. So this is Sacramento. <laughs> First of all, I want to give it up for our pastor. Let's thank God for him tonight and the <laughs> team of individuals. Here at the St. Mark, is that right? St. Oh, Marks, I gotta get it right. It's not Mark, St. Marks. I met the youngest member in the church right here in the blue, I met her. Turn this mic up just a little bit if you would. My boss is a little tired from, from traveling. But I'm so humbled, I got this invitation to come to the Moon Lecture Series. I said, go to the moon, and they said no. <laughs> I said, they said, no. I said, well, who are they? And they said, well, they said, they come. And they told me about the, <clears throat> the, the, the founders of this lecture series and uh, how they, um, the, the preacher, former pastor, was considered a militant pacifist. I said, I like that. <laughs> I said, that sounds just like that brown-skinned Palestinian Jew, ra Jewish rabbi that I follow. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, I come here tonight from North Carolina. <clears throat> uh, we just left Indianapolis, uh, Indiana Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana. 
And I want to be clear, just in case you're all live streaming, I am a theologically evangelical, liberal, conservative, charismatic, liberationist, revolutionary, militant Christian. But, uh, now, my what grandma would say, that means I know Jesus for myself. <laughs> Uh, I, I come, though, with a, a, um, a call tonight. I want you to remember this, www.breachrepairers.org. And there's a link when you get there entitled Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. Um, I stepped down after 12 years of serving as an NAACP state president, the largest state conference in the South, second in the nation, and answered the call, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute, to serve I'm president of Repairs of the Breach, but to serve as the co-chair, along with Reverend Dr. Leo, Liz Theo Harris, of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. And I'm coming tonight for an altar call. I'm coming tonight as we're traveling across the country building this campaign. I'll talk about it a little bit of why we believe it is essential in this particular moment. Just a little bit, if you all would. Put your, I'm gonna ask you, come on with me. Mm. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna the walking, keep on a marching, marching up the freedom way. Ain't gonna let no president. Oh, mm. ain't gonna let turn me around. I'm gonna. Keep on a talking, marching up the freedom way. Everybody, last time, ain't gonna let nobody. Well, ain't gonna let nobody turn. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up the freedom way. That's a good choir rehearsal. I want to talk for a while tonight and lecture with you about saving the heart and soul of our democracy. Why America needs a poor people's campaign and a national moral revival. It's so honored to be here with you today. 100 years ago, almost exact to the time we're in now, the American democracy was under great moral and political threat. In 1916, Woodrow Wilson was in the White House, who would serve as the 28th president of the United States from 1913 to 1921. He was a member of the then Democratic Party. He had even gotten a large percentage of African Americans to vote for him, to break ties with the Lincoln Republicans. Wilson had served as president of Princeton University, and he was considered a progressive Democrat when he served as governor of New Jersey. Wilson's victory in 1912 made him the first Southerner elected to the presidency since Zachary Taylor. Now, Teddy Roosevelt had lost because, remember, he broke with both the Republican and the Democratic Party, went into the Bull Party, and in 1912, he did a speech where he declared that some issues ought not be Democrat or Republican. He said health care was a moral issue. Education was a moral issue. Taking care of the environment was a moral issue. A minimum wage 
was a moral issue. So Social Security was a moral issue. Teddy Roosevelt declared that because he was moved by the power of the social gospel and persons like Walter Rauschenbusch <clears throat> and the, the man who wrote the book In His Steps, Charles Sheldon. He didn't win. He didn't win. Um, but later on, much of what he said in 1912 would come to pass, but he lost. William Taft lost. Woodrow Wilson won. The first Southerner since 1848. He led the United States during World War I. And though he was president of an Ivy League school and had been governor of a northern state, he was a white supremacist. Wilson was. He was a white nationalist in practice and in policy, which proves that just having an education and political power does not save you from the disease of white supremacy. Now, white nationalism and white supremacy were alive and well 100 years ago in the progressive area. When Woodrow Wilson ascended to the White House, white populists had gotten behind the white supremacy campaign of the then Democratic Party that was the precursor to the Dixiecrats and the extreme Strom Thurmond Republicans of the 1960s. In the 1800s, these these extremists that, had, that set up the election for Woodrow Wilson had torn apart the reconstruction of the 1860s that was led by black and white fusionists, Lincoln Republicans all over the South. Many people don't know that history, that black and whites were working together in the South less than three years after the Civil War. All of the Southern legislators rewrote their constitutions were controlled either by majority black legislative bodies or majority black white fusion. And many of those persons were Christians, were preachers. But these deconstructionists had torn apart the, the justice moral post-slavery vision. And in its place, they built a political machine Maintain, to maintain white rule only for the Democrats then who paved the way for the Dixocrats. They actually <clears throat> created the Klan in 1872, just four years after the Reconstructionists began to change the South and thereby change America. And when they first formed the Ku Klux Klan, they did not form them to go after black people. They formed them to go after white people who dared to work with black people in challenging and changing the nation from its history of slavery towards a more perfect union. Now, these extremists, these deconstructionists, they railed against public education. They did not believe in public education for all children. They took away freedmen hospitals that gave free health care to former slaves and pre, pre, free issue blacks and poor white people. They eradicated health care. Hmm. 1868, 69. They always wanted to cut taxes. <laughs> they railed against taxes so that they could disempower the government from rectifying the government sponsored genocide of slavery. They changed criminal justice laws. They instituted voter suppression and Jim Crow. They elected backward thinking presidents over and over again. And they even elected one in 1877 who lost the popular vote. <laughs> and they cut a deal with him. And they gave him the White House through the Electoral College and he promised to give them the Supreme Court. He promised to help them roll back the, 18, the 1875 Civil Rights Act. And by 1883, just five years after his presidency, that was done. These deconstructionists, they repealed and replaced civil rights laws and sponsored violent riots, attacked black and white politicians. So when Wilson came to office, the stage had already been set. 
By the time he came to office, gone was the public memory of the red strings who hang red strings outside of their windows in the South to let people know they were for America and for the Union and for freedom. Gone was the Reconstruction government with African American and white representation working to build a new America that had fought back against the Klan. Gone was all of that, all of the progressive legislation, gone by the time Wilson ran for office. And the white supremacists and nationalists were delighted in 1913, 14, and 15 to have their man in the White House. As soon as he got in office, he reneged on any of his promises he had made to African Americans. In fact, he kicked African Americans out of his office, William Trotter and others, when they went into his office to demand that he do what he said he was going to do during the campaign. He came into office immediately. He began to resegregate federal offices in D.C. and around the country. And in March of 1915, 101 years before Bannon, President Wilson invited his old college buddy from North Carolina, the Reverend Thomas Dixon, to screen the film adaptation of his popular novel at the White House. Wilson brought all of his staff in, and they looked at the novel called The Klansman, but when it was put on film, the first of these films that you could hear, it was called Birth of a Nation. And Wilson played that movie 101 years before Bannon to all of his staff, all of his cabinet. It was a revisionist history of the worst kind that declared that white, white and black folk working together was sinful and, and, and they'd only been rescued because of the Klan and because of the deconstructionists that took over the political process. He watched this movie and gave it presidential blessing. So my brothers and sisters, I wanted to begin here tonight and say to us, what we are seeing in America today is not new. I'm so troubled. I just heard it on CNN tonight. A young guy who's running for governor in Virginia. He's a good guy, but he said, what we're seeing now we've never seen before. And it makes me cringe because the fact we don't look at what we have seen before, we are misinterpreting what we see now. In fact, what happened in Charlottesville has to be understood through the lens of this history so that you don't get it twisted. The question about statues, statues is not whether we respect the dead. The statues that you saw alt-right and, and unite the right gather around, they did not go up out of respect for the, the Civil War. No, 80% of those monuments were erected 50 years after the Civil War. They couldn't have been erected right after the Civil War because it would have been considered treason. Robert E. Lee said, I don't even want to be buried in a Confederate uniform because it was no such thing as a, con as a Confederate army versus the Union army. It was the American army versus treasonous. These monuments were erected between 1896 and 1922. These monuments were erected right after Plessy versus Ferguson made separate but equal the law of the land. These monuments were erected after the deconstruction of Reconstruction. These monuments were erected, 80% of them between 1898 and 1922, to celebrate the reestablishment of white supremacy and white nationalism in the law. So the issue is not the statues, but the statutes that the statues represent. In fact, the one in Charlottesville was commissioned in 1917 to pay homage to Woodrow Wilson because the white nationalists, white supremacists believed that they had their man in the White House. Could it be that 100 years later, the reason they chose 
to march around that statue is because once again, white nationalists, white supremacists believe they have their man in the White House. Now those of us who came up in the Southern freedom struggle know that after 1914, beginning fully in 1954, Brown, with the Brown decision, Brown versus Board of Education, it overturned Plessy. It took 58 years for that to happen, from 1896 to 1954. And, and, and Brown signaled a, a, the fighting citizenship in this society was redefined by thousands of courageous men, women, and children who were willing to risk life and limb to challenge white supremacy. What is usually called the Civil Rights Movement, I like to call it America's Second Reconstruction. It lasted in earnest from 1954 until its institutions and leaderships were fractured in the late 1960s. That moral movement did not achieve all that it desired and the backlash against it deconstructed much of the good it was able to achieve. And it didn't, it's not like the movement just ended. People were killed, assassinated. Kennedy, Swanner, Chaining, Goodman, Malcolm, Martin, Bobby, and so many others. But I want to pause here to measure the time between the ascension of white supremacy to the White House in 1914 and the emergence of a resistance that affected political and legislative change in this nation. Between birth of a, the showing of birth of a nation and the decision of Brown we suffered 40 long years in the wilderness. 40 years. The fundamental questions that American democracy faced in 1914, 1915, 1916, 17, and 18 are the same questions we face now. Do we have a government that represents all Americans? Can we reconstruct a system founded on white supremacy and plantation capitalism? Is it possible to live up to our promise of liberty and justice for all and to be indivisible? We cannot watch a football game without facing these questions today. What questions? The questions like this, is America possible? In 2017, we faced the same fundamental questions we faced in 1917. But we cannot, in our present crisis, I believe, afford to wander another 40 years in the wilderness. The fierce urgency of now is not so much about Donald Trump. Sorry to tell you that. Even if he was impeached tomorrow, it wouldn't fix this. Trump has no moral commitment for what he's doing. Pence believe he's an agent of God. And it's not just Pence and Trump, it's the whole mindset and systems that, have, that, that brought them into office. See, the world has endured narcissists before. But more to the point, we cannot afford to wait because the forces that brought Trump to power threatened to upend the very notion of democracy and destroy the earth itself. What is more, we are seeing every day, Pastor, why we have to have a moral movement because our public leadership has demonstrated they have no capacity to resist these disastrous forces on either side of the aisle. Democrats are afraid to talk about race. Everybody wants to talk about everything but the racial analysis. And then those who are on that other side of the aisle, case in point, Senator Bob Corker, Senator Flake, they can tell the media that he and every, what he and every other senator knows. Trump needs a babysitter, and his actions threaten the democracy. But they cannot muster any real resistance to his nationalistic agenda. For the most part, they and others support his attacks on immigrants. They support his sabotage of health care. They support bloating of the defense spending. They support unchecked fossil fuel extraction. They, where were those? Where are those who claim they don't like his antics, but they keep lining up with his agenda? They keep talking about the tone of his language, but then they agree with the trajectory of his policies. Where are they when Trump signs a Muslim ban? 
Where are they when he decides to, he wants to take and get rid of health care for 30 million Americans? Where, where have they been when Congress wants to cut taxes and yet recommend $85 billion increases in military spending and build more nuclear weapons? Where are they on, on these extremists? What we face is not simply a political problem, not in the terms of Democrat versus Republican. It is not a left problem or a right problem. It's a heart, soul problem. The very heart of our democracy is at stake. The very soul of it. And if we are to understand this current crisis of citizenship in America, we must pay attention to at least five diseases that threaten the health of our common life. Why do I call them diseases? Because the issue is so much bigger than Democrat versus Republican. That language is too puny. It's too small for what we face today. What we face today, just as in the period between 1898 and 1922, is really about whether we can be a government of, by, and for the people. It is about whether we are serious about we the people. It is whether we are serious about moving more and more towards the establishment of justice, providing for the common defense, promoting the general fair, and ensuring domestic tranquility. And it is serious, it is really about whether America can repent like the Constitution calls us to when it says we are, we are, we are, we are striving to be a more perfect nation, which means we are not, which means we cannot claim perfectionism or an exceptionalism that cannot be challenged? Will our policies and citizenship strive toward the goals of justice or will we settle for a political and social life based on who hates who? Will we uphold the great and universal moral principles of religion for every nation, love, justice, mercy, grace, care for the poor, the immigrant, the sick, the broken, the battered? Or will we simply have survival of the fittest, greed, isolation, xenophobia, and racism to be our guide? Our answer, I believe, my friends, is rooted in how we address and diagnose and face the five diseases in our democracy at this time. We need an analysis that is clear. If we're gonna save the heart and soul of this country, we must address the disease of systemic racism. Since the rejection election of 2016, when certain forms of white rage propelled the candidate who was endorsed by the KKK to the Republican National Convention to declare that I and I alone can fix things, and then on to the White House, race has been ever before us in America. But our national conversation about racism has always been so confused and it gets even more confused post events like Charlottesville because the question comes whether there were good people on both sides or, or as rightfully so, politicians denounce the hate and the death of Heather, but they don't deal with or we don't deal with what precipitated the hate. Every politician in America that had any sense condemned hate after Charlottesville. But racism is not even about hate alone. I don't know if you heard Richard Spencer went back to Charlottesville last weekend or two ago and he said, we came peacefully and we'll come peacefully again. Racism isn't about whether you have a black friend. Racism isn't about whether you use the N-word. Institutional racism is policy and it's about power. Let me see if I can walk through history again. After the civil rights movement, certain white supremacists and white nationalist people who were afraid of losing power learned how to perpetuate the culture of racism without appearing to be racist. They used code words. They created a new lexicon. It's called the Southern Strategy. It was a strategy deliberately designed to play the race card in a way that would drive Southern whites to vote for extremist white politicians and leave the ranks of the Democratic Party that had elected people like John Kennedy and Lyndon Baines Johnson, who had helped to usher in public policy goals and the demands of the civil rights movement, even if they did it reluctantly. 
In a starkly revealing interview, former GOP strategist Lee Atwater boldly described how the Southern strategy worked to undermine fusion-type political movements that brings all people together around common, common issues and, de and, and the fusion uh, organizing that deals with race and class together, which is the kind of movement, the only kind of movement that has ever expanded our democracy during the first reconstruction of the 1800s and the second of the 1960s. This is what Lee Atwater said. He said, you start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. But by 1968, you can't say nigger because it'll hurt you politically, it'll backfire. So you have to learn new language. So you start talking about things like force busing, states' rights, neighborhood schools. And then Lee Atwater said he, he counseled all of his, 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 his um, his clients to become very abstract and talk only about cutting taxes. He said, now all these things sound totally economic, but the byproduct of them is that blacks and brown people get hurt worse than whites, and whites begin to believe that black and brown people are causing their problems because the government is giving all this free stuff to them. He said the target of the Southern strategy was to, was to play three-card molly particularly on the white political electorate, huh? to move the cards and you never know which one was the red one. And the goal was initially the old confederacy, the 13 states from Virginia all the way to Texas, because if you could control 13 states, I know California, y'all think you're big, but it, but, and you are, you're probably bigger than the 13 states, but if, do you know if you can control 13, the former 13 confederate states, you control 171 electoral votes? which means you only need 99 from the other 37 states. You control 30% of the United States Congress, which means you only need 21% from the other 37 states. You control 26 members of the United States Senate, which means you only need 25 from the other 37 states. And the goal was, if we can control that block, if we can, we can, we can create a hate them kind of politics, that will, would repeal and repel, excuse me, any fusion political alliance between whites and blacks and brown people, then we could win. And George Wallace found out when he stood in the door of the University of Alabama and got 100,000 congratulation cards from the North that this strategy could also work in the North and in parts of the Midwest. In fact, in, Wins in the Wisconsin primary in 1964, more than a third of the state's Democrats cast their ballots for George Wallace. Mm -hmm. Three weeks later, Wallace, the guy, the, 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 the segregation yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and, and, and he, three weeks later, Wallace landed 30% of the votes cast in Indiana, and he only had two Ku Klux Klan men running a shoestring campaign out of a service station phone booth. In Maryland, Democratic primary, Wallace won 16 of the state's 23 counties and 43% of the final tally. And he himself said, without the nigger block vote, we could have won the whole thing. Now, he was the greatest loser of all time because he taught something that then um, um, Phil, um, Kevin Phillips picked up on and taught Nixon, and that is how to use race and the code words to split the electorate and to get people to vote against their own self-interest. In fact, it was George H.W. Bush that saw the volcanic white opposition to the Democratic Party's embrace of the civil rights open the door for Republicans to run, and Bush, who never ran before, decided to run for the United States Senate in, 19, in the 1960s, and this is what he said as he ran. He said, I'm opposed emphatically to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 because it tramples on the Constitution, it upends states' rights, and I'm for the 86% of the people, not the 14% of the people. This is the kind of gentler white supremacy <laughs> that brought Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats into the Republican Party, paving the way for the campaigns of Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan and the Bushes, all whom employed the same political operative and operations the same divide and conquer tactics using the code words and, and of race to get elected. So don't let anybody tell you that the problem is just Trump. Yes, 
Trump has embraced and emboldened white nationalists who rallied in Charlottesville and elsewhere. Yes, they feel like they can take off their hoods off and stand tall with Trump in the White House, but long before Trump mastered the con of the Southern strategy, he had an audience that had been cultivated for 50 years. And if we don't deal with that, what, should, what we should be concerned about is not just that Trump used these strategies, but the ease at which he used them, and that the media nor his opponents knew how to unpack it. And it's only with this history in mind that we can comprehend what Brother Tanishi Coates has said so well, amplifying the analysis of our dear sister Nell Painter. And Nell Painter says that what we are seeing now is the iconography of an American characteristic called call and response, the call for justice, and then the response is backlash. And this is what Tanisha Coates said. He said, for Trump, it almost seems that the fact of Obama, the fact of a black president insulted him personally. Replacing Obama is not enough. Trump has made the negation of Obama's legacy the foundation of his own. And this too is a form of whiteness. Race is an idea, not a fact. Race is not a fact, it's an idea. Donald Trump arrived in the wake of something more potent, an entire presidency of a black man, which allowed him to feed racism by destroying everything done under a black presidency, which is making, which he calls making America great again. So he never has to say race words. He just goes after everything that was done after a black president and thereby racializes the whole electorate. So he goes after black health care, black climate accords, black nuclear agreement. And Tanishi Coates doesn't use the word black. He uses another word, black justice reform, all of which could be targeted for destruction on the basis that we have to redeem the country which, by the way, was the same language of the de deconstructionists of the 1800s. They, too, said we have to redeem America and make it great again. So Tanishi Coates says Trump is truly something new, the first president whose entire political existence hangs on the fact of a black president. No Obama, there would be no Trump. And so it will not suffice to say that Trump is a white man like all others who rose to become president. He must be called by his rightful honorific, says Brother Coates, America's first white president. We, must, we misunderstand the challenge of systemic racism if we think it's about dislike of black people. No, systemic racism is about dislike of democracy. Now, here's the thing I want to drop in this room. You can be black and embrace and encourage white nationalists. You can be black and be a white nationalist. Ben Carson. <laughs> and I love him. He operated on my daughter. But his politics are the politics of white nationalism. Uh, Senator Tom Scott, Tim Scott. Hmm? Systemic racism is simply the perpetuation of a system where the ideal of whiteness and white power are the norm in our current life. It is to accept the heresy that some people were not made in the image and likeness of God, but white nationalism and white supremacy and systemic racism is about policy. So even if you're black, but you support the policy, and all you got to do to know the policy of white supremacy is go Google it. White supremacists are for voter suppression. Since the United States Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act, for instance, in 2013, there's been an assault on voting rights in this country. 868 fewer voting sites in the black and brown and poor white community in 2016 than we had in 2012. 22 states, that's the number of states that have passed voter suppression laws since 2010. That's 44 senators and nearly 50% of the United States House of Representatives that have been impacted by voter suppression. More than four years, that's how long it's been since the Supreme Court gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Now, Strom Thurmond, filibustered the Civil Rights Act of 1957 for 24 hours. McConnell and Ryan and Boehner have filibustered fixing the voting rights for over four years. That's over a thousand days longer than Strom Thurmond did in 1957. 
We talk about Trump winning Wisconsin by 20 or 30,000 votes, but there were 250,000 voters suppressed in Wisconsin. This is the election hacking that no one wants to talk about. I, now, I don't know how much Trump, help Trump got from Russia, but I'm sure there was plenty of help that's coming out. It's manifestly clear, however, that he could not have stolen the election. He did not win it. You don't lose by three million votes and win an election. You can never certify that in a democracy. If they certify it, we can't certify it. Uh, but he could have stolen the election without the help of systemic racism. There's no way. Whether their tactics are partisan gerrymandering or discriminatory photo ID or the rollback of early voting, same day registration, the places where we see an attack on voting rights in America are the same places where we see the highest level of poverty. And so we have to make the connections between these maladies that threaten the heart of our democracy. And I believe the reason we have not heard, think about this, we had 26 presidential debates in the primary and in the general election and not one on voter suppression. Not one hour on voter suppression, not one hour. 52 years after the Voting Rights Act, we have less voting rights protection than we had 52 years ago, and we go through an entire presidential election, Democrat and Republican, and we don't have one hour debate on voter suppression. When voter suppression is at its highest since Jim Crow, some say since the 19th century when you look at redistricting. Why? Because America has never really wanted to talk about race outside of interpersonal relationships. And the problem is white nationalists will be your friend and still pass policies that destroy your life. Systemic racism is the denial of just immigration reform. Systemic racism is the prison industrial complex that has over a million and a half black and brown people inside of it. Systemic racism is former General Kelly revisioning history saying, that a compromise could have been worked out. It was compromise that created slavery and genocide in the first place. Racism is Steve Bannon talking about Judeo-Christian Western values and talking about his goal being to deconstructing the administrative state. Now, in none of those things did you hear the word, the N-word. And none of what I just said did it say hate black people, but it's about policy, <laughs> policy, policy. And that's why when a politician or anyone says, well, I'm not a white nationalist, I said, what do you mean? They said, well, I, I love black people. I'm not a white nationalist in my heart. I said, I'm not, I don't want to see your heart. I'm not a heart surgeon. I want to see the heart of your policies. White nationalists are for voter suppression. Where have you voted? White nationalists do not want to protect our immigrant brothers and sisters and give them to, where have you voted? White nationalists are against health care for everybody. Where have you been on health care? White nationalists do not believe in living wages for everybody. Where are you on living wages? White nationalists believe in the proliferation of guns. Where are you on the proliferation of guns? White nationalists believe in putting more money in prisons than they do in school, public school. Where are you on public schools and fully funded public schools? Because once I see your policies, then I know something. It's simple. I didn't even learn this when I went to Drew and got my doctor. I learned this from my grandmama. If you walk like a duck and quack like a duck, you must be a duck. It's just real simple. But then there's a second disease, unjust and immoral attacks on the poor, a harm in the heart and soul. In the richest nation in history in the world, we don't like to talk about the fact that a third of our population is crippled by some form of poverty, a third at least. Republicans often blame the poor for their plight, saying it's because folk didn't live right. While Democrats insist on talking about those who keep striving to enter the middle class, and sometimes I want to say to my Democrat brothers and sisters, some folk are not striving to make it into the middle class. They are trying to save their rhymes with class every day. That's all they're trying to do. They're trying to save it. Some folk are poor, and the poor are getting poor. Right now, we're having a tax debate about cutting a trillion and a half dollars from the budget. Now, remember what I told you about in the 1800s? The white national, white supremacists, the first thing they argued was for was tax cut. We're talking about cutting a trillion dollars which will threaten health care, social safety nets for the poor, 
will raise food and sell taxes, which will devastate the poor. And sadly, the conversation is stuck on how it's going to impact the middle class. You notice that? Nobody talking about how it's going to impact the poor. It's like, oh, like poor is a bad word. And sadly, many of the poor whites supporting the tax cutters because of the racialized framing of social programs don't even realize that there are eight million more poor white people than there are poor black people. And five million more poor white people than there are brown people. That's one of the reasons we're organizing in places now like Appalachia and pulling the covers off of this ugly deception. Former Secretary of Labor Robert Wright said the ranks of the working poor, that's not even the extreme poor, the working poor are growing because wages at the bottom have dropped adjusted for inflation with increasing numbers of Americans taking low paying jobs in retail sales, restaurants, hotels, hospitals, childcare, elder care and other personal services without living wages. The pay of the bottom fifth is falling closer to the minimum wage at the same time that the real value of the federal minimum wage is lower today than it was a quarter century ago. If it had kept pace with inflation, the minimum wage would be almost $20 an hour. In fact, in fact, the reality is that in the U.S., while we claim to be the leader of the free world, we pay half of its Af African American workers and 60% of Latino workers less than $15 an hour. 62 million Americans, mostly white, make less than 15, and many more make less than a living wage, while CEOs make an average of 300 times more than the average worker. 250,000 people die every year from poverty, according to the Mailman School of Public Policy, which is more people than die from heart attack, cancer, and strokes. The economic growth America has seen, especially since the Great Recession, has overwhelmingly benefited our wealthiest ministers. Greedy corporate criminals on Wall Street got bailouts while working American jobs were shipped overseas or outsourced to contractors. There are 400 families in America that make an average of $97,000 an hour while we are locking people up who make $15, who want 15 and a union. In the 21st century, the divide between the rich and the poor in this country has grown exponentially. There are 14 million poor children 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And we know right now, according to the Children's Defense Fund, if we just took 2% of our federal budget and put it in programs that work, we could eradicate 60% of that poverty. It is not scarcity, it is will. The top zero. The top 0.1% of income earners in America today make 198 times more than the bottom 90%. And this is not about class war, it is about economic policies that are war on the poor, which is why you can have unemployment go down, but people still be poor because wages do not come up. As has happened so often in our history, from Bacon's Rebellion up to the present, race was used in 2016 to pit poor white people against poor black and brown people. But again, look at the maps. Nine out of 10 of America's poorest states are so-called red states. The so-called white working, working class in raw numbers is hurt the most from the economic injustice that is perpetrated through tax cuts and deregulation and denial of federal existence. And somebody has to tell some folk eventually this. If you black and you can't pay your light bill because you poor, and you white and you can't pay your light bill because you don't make enough, and if you brown and you can't pay your light bill because you don't make enough, we all black in the dark. And here is the eerie connection between race and economic poverty. The very people who get into office through racialized voter suppression and through these wedge issues like abortion and against homosexuality and against for prayer in the school, that's what they use to get into office, race and wedge issue. Once they get into office, however, they vote against increasing wages, against the expansion of Medicaid, and against the extension of federal unemployment. They even vote against the earned income tax credit. So they get into office by using racism, but then once they get into office, they pass policies that hurt everybody. 
racism and classism mix to make a poisonous concoction. And that is why we can never have a conversation in America that separates race and class. Number three, the disease is ecological devastation. We don't have to look far. The earth is hurting from Harvey to Irma to Maria. So fast, so many floods in Asia, earthquakes in Mexico, Central America, even a few years ago in North Carolina and South Carolina, places folk didn't expect earthquakes to happen. Look at what we've seen in just the past two months. And sometimes we call these natural disasters, but there's nothing natural about the rate at which we are experiencing this upheaval. Between 1970 and 1979, meteorologists recorded 660 disasters around the world. Between 2000 and 2009, there were 3,322. In between, in the 1980, climate scientists testified before Congress and explained to the public that two centuries of fossil fuel extraction had not only built a global economy, but had released enough carbon into the atmosphere that the plant had a fever. Now, back then, it was a slight fever, and that was a half degree Celsius. Now that we've passed one degree Celsius, we're sick. The Earth's fever is raging. Island nations are going underwater. Major U.S. cities are soaked in toxic sludge. The vast majority of Puerto Ricans still don't have power and water. And wherever the earth is reeling, the poor suffer first and suffer worse. According to a study from the Roosevelt Institute, it suggests that poverty itself is a key contributor to climate change. The greater the inequality in a given society, the greater its carbon footprint. As the new urbanites gentrify American cities, poor service workers are pushed to the first and second ring suburbs of our cities, unable to access public transportation. They are forced to make long commutes in our least fuel efficient cars. Meanwhile, the robber barons who taken control of the federal government have pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord and done everything in their power to bring back coal rather than retrain the coal workers into safe energy. And they're making a way for new and dangerous fossil fuel pipelines. And that's not even to talk about the other side of, of our uh, ecology where we in fact can buy unleaded gas but can't buy unleaded water in Flint. Yeah. And, so, and not just Flint, many, many other places. So we have actually weaponized water in poor white, brown, and black communities. The fourth disease is the war economy. President Eisenhower, the general term commander in chief, warned of a military industrial complex when he was leaving office. And he was a general. After General Motors and American Steel had seen the boost in profits that came from both destroying and rebuilding Europe after World War II, Eisenhower knew it would be hard to keep American investors out of the business of war. And when war becomes a business, profits matter and not people. Founding father James Madison said no nation could reserve its freedom in the midst of continual war. And the quagmire of Southeast Asia's jungles brought his words of caution to the fore. So Congress passed the War Powers Act in 1973 to be a permanent check on America's war making. But even that could not endure the Reagan years. For instance, the Gipper who had played a soldier on America's TV screens, he knew how nothing unites a nation like a common enemy. So his Star Wars ballooned the defense budget even as Congress passed tax cuts that were supposed to grow a new economy. During the Reagan Bush years, the federal deficit quadrupled but our addiction to war making is nonpartisan. It continued under the Clinton years as the Department of Defense honed its capacity to make perpetual war on multiple fronts by outsourcing non-combat operations to private companies, mercenaries, what we used to call them. There were more contractors on the ground in Bosnia than U.S. troops. Bush, too, seized on 9-11 as the opportunity to declare war without end on one of the war's chief products, namely terror. In the name of national security, even the Obama administration transformed the CIA into a covert offensive arm of military operations carrying out hundreds of unmanned drone attacks around the world without any public accountability as to who was targeted, who was written off as collateral damage and at what cost. Yes, it is disturbing to consider now that thumbs which tweet spitefully against partisan allies have a capacity to type 
nuclear codes for an arsenal that could destroy the world several times over, and he wants more. But the madness of the current escalation between the U.S. and North Korea is simply the latest chapter in a long story of a war economy hell-bent on limitless growth. The U.S. has been at war with terrorism for 16 years as of October 7th, but we're killing lots of people in lots of countries, but somehow terrorism seems to be doing fine. We need another way. It's immoral that the current 2017 military budget is almost $600 billion, and that doesn't include veterans care, $182 billion, and the nuclear arsenal, $20 billion, or actual wars, about $68 billion. We were told just a few billion for Iraq. It's now gone to oh, nearly $3 trillion. It's immoral that 54 cents of every, every discretionary dollar of our tax money goes directly to the military. So that money is not going to help health care to jobs to education to infrastructure. And Trump's new 2018 guns over butter budget calls for $54 billion more to go to the military, but for Congress that wasn't enough. So they gave him not $54 billion, but $85 billion to pay for military increase. Then the environment will pay as the EPA budget is slashed. Diplomacy will pay as the State Department is slashed. Programs that help lift up people will pay. Foreign aid will pay. Think about it, if we, we cut just one billion dollars, now remember we can already blow the world up about seven times. But if we just cut $1 billion out of that bloated military budget, $1 billion could pay for 12,000 elementary school teachers for a year, 17,000 infrastructure jobs for a year, 100,000 Head Start slots for children for a year, 96,000 military vets receiving VA medical care for a year, 30,000 scholarships for university students for four years. What will really make us safer? More war, more nuclear weapons, or jobs, education, health care, and infrastructure? Structure. That's the question even now before the America. $30 billion. We could alleviate hunger nationwide, worldwide. $10 billion. We could provide clean drinking water around the world. And the question is, what will make us safer? And then the final disease. Not ra racism, yes. The tax on the poor, yes. Ecological devastation, yes, the war economy, but here's that fifth one, Christian nationalism and white supremacy. And God help the church if we don't call the church to a modern day Nicene council and challenge this heresy. Faced with these other facts, as a preacher, I would hope that, the America, that, the, that America might fall to her knees and cry out the help from God. But much of the religion in our public life has contributed to the other four diseases. Much of the religion in our public life has contributed to the moral crisis we now face. So we must add to our list of moral maladies this, namely Christian nationalism or white evangelicalism. Earlier this year, I saw a picture of a pastor of preachers laying hands on Donald Trump in the Oval Office. Does that mean hush or that mean the light's just dimming? <laughs> I saw of Donald Trump in the Oval Office, and you have to understand I am a conservative. I, I come out of a tradition where we believe in laying on hands. We believe in anointing with oil. I know all about that, and it hurt me. I was so troubled I wrote an open letter to my fellow clergy and it read like this. The teaching of Jesus are clear about caring for the poor and the sick and we are called to share his message. We cannot simply serve as chaplains to imperial power. If we pray for a person engaging in injustice, we must offer prayers that lead to conviction, not prayers that further embolden them in their wrongdoing. We must put legs on our prayers and demand that those leaders attend to the weightier matters of love, justice, and mercy. In fact, if you pray, P-R-A-Y, for leaders that are praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, on the least of these, you are engaging in a form of heresy. Heresy. 
Now, Kevin Cruz at Princeton University has documented how so-called white evangelicals and Christian nationalism can develop a public religiosity that wraps itself in the flag while doing the big bidding of big business. He, he taught us, he's a Princeton scholar, that this didn't just happen. I mean, it's as old as the magicians against Moses and Pharaoh. It's as old as the false prophets against Jeremiah and Amos. It's as old as slave religion, slave, not slave religion, the slave master's religion versus the religion of Christ that Frederick Douglass talked about. It's as old as the social gospel um, uh, type of understanding of the gospel versus those who try to protect injustice. But Kevin Cruz goes to a place, and I hate to tell y'all, but he lets us know that a lot of this mess we've seen today started in California. Oh, I'm always dangerous. I say things in people's house. <laughs> Let me see. Which way is the exit, daughter? You see, you see. Let me let me tell you what happened. It was the social gospel movement that ended up pushing Frederick Douglass to do some of the right. I'm not Frederick Douglass, Franklin Roosevelt to do some of the right things. He had a a, a labor secretary. It was the first woman, hmm? Frances Perkins. She was a social gospeler. She pushed Franklin down the road. Now, he didn't do everything he should have. He cut some deals with Southern senators over things like Social Security because they said, if you do this Social Security, we've got to make sure black people don't get it, brown people don't get it, and white women don't get it because they'll just get too up in it. So the, first, so the first Social Security plan, you couldn't pay in it if you were on the, in the agrarian culture or in the domestic culture. And that meant 50% of white women didn't get it. Black people, most black people couldn't get it. Most brown people couldn't get it. But... There was a group, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Sun Oil, General Motors, and folk like that, they hated the New Deal. They hated labor uh, rights. They hated stuff like that. They hated a minimum wage. And so they found a guy in Los Angeles named James Fifield, the Reverend James Fifield, pastor of the First Congregationalist Church. He taught that he knew how to debone the gospel. He knew how to take all of the stuff about justice and love away from the gospel and basically just preach, if you do this, you get this. If you don't do this, you don't get this. And, they, and he went to um, Washington, D.C., and he spoke before the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and told them if they funded him for his spiritual mobilization, he could create a whole new kind of theology that would, that would undermine the theories of the social gospel movement and could purchase pulpits. And they paid him millions. And... In less than 10 years, he owned 19,000 pulpits. And he came up with this twisted form of Calvinism that said, if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. So if you're a good American and you live according to certain moral standards, then you'll prosper. And if you're a bad American, that means you're poor. And that's what laid the groundwork. And so if you understand that history, then you understand that the current day Christian nationalists and white evangelists, their real God is not Christ, but cash. And that is why they are bowing to Trump, because in that theology, a wealthy businessman is, the, is, a, is a patron saint. And they give cover for it. And one nation under God, he talks about in his book, emerged as a civil religion that propped up existing powers. They taught that any social programs were, were, were social, were, were, that helped people up were a form of evil. But they allowed people to get up without meeting certain moral standards that God demanded. It is a slaveholder religion for the 20th century. These were the same preachers that wrote Dr. King when he was in the Birmingham jail, telling him, be patient and wait. But this faith in the public square is not representative of the deep moral calling of the scriptures. Now, I, every now and then I like to tell them I'm glad I'm a conservative liberal theologian because in my home you had to quote a scripture before you got your biscuits. I don't know if any of y'all from South, y'all know, and some of y'all looking at me real funny. In my house you couldn't eat unless you could quote a scripture. You know what I'm talking about? Down Mississippi, North and down South, which, and you couldn't say Jesus wept either. You couldn't be the short script. Yeah. So I often say to these folk that claim they love to claim to be Bible thumpers and they say, you know, you know, we have biblical foundation for being against gay people and biblical foundation for prayer in the school. And I say, oh, you want to talk Bible? 
because you, you do know that you can't find but about three scriptures that speak in, even say anything about homosexuality and, and most of those scriptures you misinterpret and not one of those scriptures trump this one. You still have to love your neighbor as yourself and treat everybody as a child of God. You really, you really, you really want to talk Bible? Oh, you really want to talk Bible? Well, let's talk about Ezekiel 22 that says, this is what God the master says. You are a city murderous to the core. Your, your politicians have become like wolves because they devour the poor and the sick and the hurting. And your preachers have become a covering up for the politicians and saying things that God have you really want to talk Bible? Let's talk Isaiah 10 verse 1 and 2. Woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their right and make women and children their prey. You really, really want to talk Bible? Let's talk Jeremiah 22. Go down to the palace. Tell the kings and the officials what the Lord says. The Lord says, attend to matters of justice. Set things right between people. Rescue the victims from their exploiter. Do right by the foreigners and the immigrants. Don't take advantage of the homeless, the orphans, and the widows, and stop murdering people with your political power. You really, you, you, you make, you, Jerry Falwell, Franklin Graham, you really want to talk Bible? Come here and let's go to Jesus and his first sermon. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, to heal and set free the battered and the brokenhearted, and to announce that everybody is accepted in the economy of God's love. No, I don't think you want to talk Bible. In fact, I gave your pastor a Bible that has three, all 2,500 scriptures in the Bible that talk about love, justice, and mercy. And if you cut them out, the Bible falls apart. So when you try to suggest that the borrower position for, for Christians or for any religious people, that when you try to suggest that this is the agenda of God to hate gay folk, to be against abortion, to be against, for prayer in the school, to be for gun rights, to be for property rights, and, and, and to believe that Jesus was an original member of the NRA, that ain't nothing but a lie and hypocrisy and heresy. It is nothing like the politics of God. What you have decided to do is say so much about what God says so little and say so little about what God says so much. And that is theological malpractice and it's high time that we challenge it to the the core and sometimes and sometimes and sometimes though the challenge is not just what they're doing it's what so-called progressive churches aren't doing because we fear that if we preach too much and get too much in the street we might lose a few of our members But I tell every pastor, if you haven't gotten over the fear of members, you aren't, you aren't really in fear of God. And the greatest fear you got to have is the fear of God, the wisdom, the respect of God. And so, my brothers and sisters, as I close, if we understand how these five maladies threaten the heart of our democracy, then we can be clear. Well, I need you to sign up and help us find people. Go to that website for Poor People's Campaign a national call for a moral revival. We need a moral analysis that does not simply follow the talking points of our time but digs deeper into our national psyche. A moral movement to revive the heart of our democracy must first own that we are a nation that is not struggling with these forces I mentioned, but that has always struggled. And then we need not only a moral analysis, we need moral articulation. The kind of articulation that says because of our deepest faith and our deepest constitutional traditions and when we see those things being hijacked to serve greed, racism, and lies, we must raise our voices like the prophets, like Jesus. We must cry aloud and spare not because in times like these, silence is not an option. Some things are non-negotiable. We will never say a supermajority of any party 
has a right to run roughshod over the Constitution or the higher moral laws of the universe. We must never allow hate to have the stage without lifting up the demands of love. No matter who's in power, we will remember the moral dissenters like Harry David, Henry David Thoreau and Martin King and Coretta and Fannie Lou and Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer and Dorothy Day and Rabbi Heschel. But not only do we need moral analysis and moral articulation, we must have moral activism. A tweet's not gonna do it. <laughs> Signing another petition, I signed one today, to impeach is not gonna do it. We need moral activism. We must disrupt nonviolently what is destructive, not with hate, but with revolutionary love. We must even love those who are our adversaries to, to, and with the hope that they might change. We must love this nation enough to take a knee. We must love it enough to stand between the ICE agent who has been ordered to do wrong to an immigrant neighbor who wants to do right. We must love our democracy enough to go to jail for it in nonviolent civil disobedience to sue in the courts and to register everybody you know to vote at the ballot box. I, that is why. I accepted an invitation to join and help lead the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. It's time. As Dr. King knew in 1968, we need a revolution of values in order to deal with militarism, racism, <clears throat> and, and, and materialism. Today, we need a moral revival to deal with racism, attacks on the poor, ecological devastation, the war economy, and, and white Christian nationalism. We must use our moral activism to demand and fight for a moral agenda, not just a Bernie agenda or a Clinton agenda or a Democratic agenda or Republican agenda, but we have to have some language that's not that puny. There's some sacred policies, sacred moral principles of our faith and our constitutional values, a place where even if you're atheist, you can come in and say amen because there's some, there's some universal moral and justice principles, you know, like, like pro-labor, anti-poverty policies that build up economic democracy through full employment and living wages and alleviation of disparate unemployment and guaranteed income. That's a moral issue. A just transition from fossil fuels, that's a moral issue. Labor rights is a moral issue. Affordable housing is a moral issue. Uh, helping, keeping safety nets for the poor is a moral issue. Fair policies for immigrants is a moral issue. Critiquing policies around warmongering that undermine our moral standing and our ability to address domestic issues, those are moral issues, not just Democrat versus Republican, left versus right. Equality in education by ensuring that every child receives a high quality, well-funded, constitutional, diverse public education as well as access to community college and university. Those are moral issues. Health care, expanding, health, not just Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, but health care as a human right. Everybody have access to health care. Social security, moral issue. Women's rights and women's right to their health is a moral issue. Providing environmental protection, because the last time I checked, we haven't figured out a way to lay, lay, live on Mars, is a moral issue. Fairness in the criminal justice system by addressing the continuing inequality against black, brown, and poor white people. That's a moral issue. Stopping the proliferation of guns and the unholy hold that the NRA has on our politics. Those are moral issues. Voting rights is a moral issue. Women's rights, moral, LGBTQ rights is a moral issue. We will never allow a nation to believe you can mistreat anybody or take rights away from them because of their race or their sexuality. Immigrant rights is a moral issue. Equal protection under the law is a moral issue. And that is why right now, we are preparing for 40 days of action in 2018, 40 united days. We're calling people that want to be united for 40 days of action in 25 states and in the District of Columbia. We're organizing 1,000 people per state, 2,500 in the District of Columbia. Let's just say maybe, I don't, maybe I can't tell y'all because there might be a few infiltrators in here, but I'm just, just <laughs> this is just a suggestion that what might happen from, from Mother's Day, which means birth 
birth to June 21st, the summer solstice, uh, for, 40, 40, for 40 days, led by an agenda, not just hollering and being mad and nobody knows what you're upset about, but an agenda-based activism. Let me see, what would we name that? Oh, I know, the souls of poor folk, <laughs> auditing America 50 years after the poor, poor people's campaign. And, and what if we had a movement, not for the poor, but with the poor, poor of every color, every, every race, every kind, every sexuality, joining with clergy of all different faiths, joining with people uh, who have a deep moral con concern, the moral consciousness, and they engage in simultaneous, not one doing something one day and another doing it, but what if we could have, let me see, simultaneous agenda-based civil disobedience in 25 state houses and the office of Ryan and McConnell at the same time? Hmm. I'm, I'm just saying, I, 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 I'm just saying. I don't know why y'all getting so excited. I'm just talking about an idea. And, um, and, and, and what if this nonviolent, you can't wear masks and stuff, it's nonviolent. You got to be willing to show your face. It's nonviolent. We're not going in to kill people. We're going in to lift up the, the faces of those who are hurting. And we're going in to, we're going to have pray and lifting up the faces and the plight of the poor. And let's just say, what if it was at least one day, might be more, but at least one day a week agenda. Let's see, maybe the first week could be child poverty. And, and women with clergy and, 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 and welfare rights workers and others would join together and, and the news would go something like this uh, breaking news <clears throat> 150 clergy and poor people and others just walked into the California state legislature demanding an agenda around child, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, the same thing is now happening in Washington, we understand. Wait a minute, we gotta, yes, Kansas, what is that, Kansas? Missouri, Mississippi too, Alabama, South Carolina, you mean they're in the state house in South Carolina too? And in North Carolina, yeah, from California to the Carolina, Carolinas, they're going in, and they're going in singing, ain't gonna let nobody, turn us around, they got an agenda in the hand, wait a minute, breaking news, 250 just went into Ryan's office, 250 just went into McConnell's office, and what if that happened for simultaneously, all at one time, and what if at the end of it, 25,000 people across this nation will have been arrested for civil disobedience around an agenda? It's never happened before in the history of America. Dr. King only wanted 3,000, but what if we could get 25,000? in 25 states and the District of Columbia. It might be that if we come together, we can shift the narrative. We can't tweet the narrative, but we can shift the narrative. And we could break through the tweets. We could break through the money. We could break through the glittery objects. We could, we could break through the noise. We could break through until we could break through hate. We could break through meanness. We could unite together. And I'm not talking about 350 million people. Just 20 5,000 people out of the 350. In other words, a remnant. That's what the Bible calls it, a remnant. In Amos chapter 5, God says, if I can just get a remnant to cry in the street, then I'll show up and I'll begin to make a difference. What if we could for just 40 days, not 365 days, put aside our differences, put aside our division, put aside our organizational egos and come together to say we're going to address systemic racism and poverty and the war economy and ecological devastation and this heretical form of religion that is hurting our people our moral standing and hurting our moral conversation. What if we could do that for six weeks straight? I believe we could change the narrative. We could force CNN, force MSNBC, force Fox to have to talk about it. My God. And if we change the narrative, then we can work on the agenda. And if we work on the agenda, we can get folk out to vote. Because a lot of people aren't voting because they aren't hearing their name. They aren't hearing their issues. They don't believe that anything is going to change. And I'm here to tell you my heart's belief as I really finish right now. We must come together not to save a party we must build a campaign. I'm tired of commemorating what they did 50 years ago. We don't need another commemoration about the march across this, this Pettus Bridge or another commemoration about the Poor People's Campaign or another commemoration on the march on Washington. We need to realize and reimagine and have a consecration and a re-engagement. We can't give up on this democracy or on this world, not now, not ever. The psalmist says, 
in the Bible. The stone that the builders rejected can become the chief cornerstone. I believe that if the stones that have been rejected in this nation come together. I mean, the folk in here that have felt rejected because you're gay, felt rejected because you're poor, felt rejected because you're black, felt rejected because you don't go along with this so-called white evangelicalism. If anybody here felt rejected because you're a woman or felt rejected because you're a student or felt rejected, well, if the stones that have been rejected come together, we can shift the moral narrative. We can cause a third reconstruction in America. And the truth is, I would rather die trying than to live and never try and it be written on my tombstone that in a time of struggle, we did nothing to stand up and change things. I know the power. Uh, give, me, give me three minutes. I feel like preaching now. I know the power of coming together. I know the power of coming together. I know it biblically because when Moses and his people and his rod got together, Pharaoh came down and the sea had to open up. When Esther and Mordecai faced the narcissistic tower building king in their day, but when Esther and Mordecai came together, they were able to stop the plots of destruction against the Jewish people. When the disciples came together in the upper room, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were able to leave the upper room and stand against a narcissistic tower builder named Caesar of their day. I know the power of coming together biblically, but I also know that power historically. The truth is when you hold on to truth and you hold on to justice, justice has never lost. Now I didn't say justice hadn't been fought. I didn't say justice hadn't been bruised and beat up, but justice has never lost. During slavery, it looked like justice had lost, but when Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, some Quakers and white preachers like William Lloyd Garrison got together, they formed a fusion movement that brought about abolition. Women didn't have the right to vote. But when Sojourner Truth and a Quaker named Lucretia Mott got together, they won the right to vote. Plessy versus Ferguson looked like it had the victory. But when Thurgood Marshall got white lawyers and black lawyers and Jewish lawyers together, an all-white Supreme Court with one member who had been a bona fide member of the KKK and voted unanimously. And Justice Warren, who was from California, who everybody thought would be wrong on civil rights because he was wrong on ch the Chinese people, he ended up voting unanimously to tear down separate but equal. It looked like Jim Crow had beaten down injustice and couldn't rise again. But when Rosa Parks and Martin King and Bayard Rustin and Glenn Smiley and Jonathan Daniels and Viola Wusa and Cesar Chavez, when they all got together, they tore Jim Crow down. Looked like apartheid was going to win forever. But when Bishop Tutu and Nelson Mandela and those women got to... Uh, we're walking in the light of God. The apartheid came down. So I know it biblically. I know it historically. But I also know it personally. So let me close by saying why I'm so sure if we come together, we can change the narrative. Several years ago, some said I'd never walk again. They said I'd never get out of a wheelchair. I was 30 years old. I'd always depended on my legs. But I woke up one morning. I couldn't move. A massive disease had hit my body. It's in my spine. It's everywhere. The, even my x-rays now said I'm really not supposed to be walking. I spent months in a bed at UNC Hospital didn't know if I'd ever be able to do anything without a walker or a wheelchair. For 12 years, I was in a wheelchair and I was on a walker. I went through depression, but over those 12 years, somehow, my mind got together. And then my doctors got together, and my nurses got together, and my therapists got together, my pharmacists got together, the praying folk at my church got together, my family got together, my swim coat got together, and then the Holy Ghost got together. I can jump now. I can walk now. I'm a witness that when we all get together, what a day of justice it will be. When we all get together, what a day. What a day! 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 What a day of justice it will be. It's time for a poor people's campaign and a national call for a moral revival. If you're going to get together, somebody say yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we all get together, what a day of justice it will be. 
Okay, why don't you sit down? Because we'll take some questions. All right, who's got a question? Right there. I see a question back here. Did you meet Joy Reid? Is she cool or what? Ah, Joy Reid is a powerful sister. In fact, she's a person of faith. And we've met and we had some interesting conversations. And she decided one day, she called me, she said, you know what we need? We need a moral moment, at least twice a month, for somebody to come on and interpret what's going on um, through the lens of faith that doesn't sound like this heretical, hip, uh, uh, this hypocritical heresy that we see going on where people, where, where the forces are really trying to offer their opinions as scripture and refuse to deal with the deep moral and religious purpose. So that's why every, twice a month, I go on and do what's called a moral moment. In fact, tomorrow morning, I'll be doing a moral moment because Jerry Falwell, um, Jr., had a man arrested this week a professor that he disagreed with, a reverend, uh, about Trump, and said that he was a threat to the campus. When they filed his, um, when, they, when they wrote um, why they did it, though they, they made the claim that they were still open to debate. So tomorrow, actually today, we announced through Red Letter Christians, they announced tomorrow that myself, uh, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, Reverend Dr. Um, um, Nelson Johnson, Minister Jonathan Hargrove, Reverend Dr. John Mendez, and Reverend Dr. Radley, um, Rodney Sadler, uh, who's a PhD in New Testament, Dr. Th Theo Harris, a PhD in, I mean, Dr. Sadler, a PhD in Old Testament, Dr. Theo Harris, a PhD in New Testament. We are challenging to them to that debate. We're saying it's time. Y'all, you're no longer gonna have a free ride. We're no longer gonna seed the conversation. And so we are actually saying to them, Let's come together, pick the time, pick the place, pick the moderator, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna challenge, because that's what the ancient church did. The ancient church would call a council, right? When you were going around in the name of Jesus claiming stuff, or claim, they called a council to discern heresy from truth, and we are challenged, we're going to be talking about that tomorrow morning. Is there another? Yeah, there's another one here, but Bishop Bauer, I just wanted to let you know that our moon lecturer last month was Nancy Giles, and as she was traveling from the airport in New Jersey last month on her way here, she bumped into Joy Reid. And Joy Reid heard about St. Mark's and she said, well, if you're gonna speak to people of faith, you're gonna to have to talk the faith journey and do it well. Uh, so Joy Reid had her input last month. Yeah, she's a tremendous, tremendous anchor. Dr. Barber. Yes, sir, who am I talking to? I'm David Fontaine. Yes, sir. I was wondering, is there any Republican, Democrat, or independent politician that reflects the values and has the strategies and the morality that uh, you spoke up that we need this evening? Yeah, first thing, I, I tend not to, I'm an independent, just let you know. And we are organizing in um, Appalachia, one of the strongest organizing places we're doing now, and I, and I gave the same message to it here, is in Mitchell County that's 99% white, 89% Republican. Every um, African American was run out in 1920. Uh, after 13 weeks of Marl Monday, um, we took Marl Monday on the road around North Carolina. I got a request to come to Mitchell County. And they said, we want to come, we want you to come. And they said, will you come? And my answer was, hell no, I'm not going up there because <laughs> I mean, I did. I should probably shouldn't have said that. I asked forgiveness, but I mean, you know, Mitchell County has one of the highest rates of paramilitary groups, and, and, and it's one road in and one road out. And so then my good friend, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm born at night, but not last night, you know. But, 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 then, but then, because we had about 12% of Republicans got arrested with us in Mall Monday. Probably people don't know that story. We didn't start the moral movement in North Carolina challenging Democrats. We start, I mean, Republicans, we started it challenging Democrats in 2007. But, so a friend of mine, real quickly, who's a Methodist minister, old man, he, um, um, Vernon Tyson, uh, he came to me and said, you gotta go. Those are my people, I'll go with you. And so I said, okay, Vern. 
And so, of course, a quick story, that morning when we got ready to go, I, that Sunday I preached real hard at my church. Because <laughs> in, in, in our churches, see, if you die, they put a black shawl over the chair. And if it only stayed there a week, that means they're glad the Lord delivered them from you. <laughs> and uh, I kissed my wife real, real good. And I got two sisters to go with me who could sing. I said, maybe if they sing a little bit, it won't be so bad. I took my security guard, but he's old. And he got a gun, but it's old. And the bullets are more likely to give you gangrene than to do anything. And so we got there about dusk dark, and I was like, this, why, you know, and then they put me, my back to the window, and, and there wasn't nobody in there, there was nobody black in there, but the three, three of us, and uh, Dr. Tim Tyson, he went up there, who's Vernon's um, son, he wrote this, the book, Blood Doesn't Sign My Name, and I said, okay, I said, well, if you're going to go, just go. And so I started talking, same, similar things, a little different, and they, And then I asked the question, I said, I started talking about how they had voted for people because, you know, uh, they, they lied to them about voter fraud, they told them about praying in school and being against gay people. I said, but did you know, I said, let me ask you a question. How many people in Mitchell County uh, would benefit from um, um, the Affordable Care Act? And they said, not, not a whole lot, because see, up there it had been racialized. I said, a thousand people in this county, and there can't be no black people because none up here. And I started going down, and, and, and by the time we finished, I kept talking as long as I could, because I figured as long as I was talking, they wouldn't bother me. But, but after, after a while, I ran out of stuff to say. And so I stopped, and I said, any questions? And I'm getting to your, to your answer, and, that's, and they said, um, they said um, well, the reason we invited you up here is because we've been having Moral Mondays up here. But we've been doing it clandestine, because we weren't sure if you all were truly a moral movement or just another arm of the Democratic Party. They said, now we're Republican, but we're Lincoln Republicans. We're Eisenhower, we are, and Teddy Roosevelt Republican. We're not this Tea Party extremist type Republican. He said, you see that man right there? And they pointed to a guy, he's a white guy. He said, he just resigned as chair of the Republican Party. I said, for real? They said, yeah. And then another lady stood up and she said, I want to know, can we form a chapter of the NAACP? That's exactly how, and you know, I'm part Pentecostal. So when they asked about a chapter in the NAACP under my breath, I went into tongues. I said, Shaka la ba so ba ba da da sha da ba da. You know, because I'm there, I was like, what is going on? And, she, and she, I'm serious. And she said, now it's going to be all white. And I said, well, it was all white when it got started. For the most part, the NAACP was predominantly white. I said, uh, she said, but we fight, and we, we got a saying up here, the stuff you taught us tonight, don't poke the bear up in these mountains, because if you poke the bear, and they have poked the bear. And I said, all right. They formed a branch of the NAACP. It has, the, it's the most active one in North Carolina, has over 300 members in less than like six months. And, and so then, the lady asked me one more question. I said, you got more? They said, yeah. They said, will you lead us on a march? I said, when? They said, tonight. I said, now wait a minute, white people. I said, wait a minute, white people, y'all. Now, I know who started that marching at night stuff, and it won't up. And uh, I'm not marching nowhere up here at night and get shot, because they're going to see my little dark spot right in the middle. And they said, well, we want to march on the state, the state legislator's home tonight and let him know. And I said, well, I tell you what, invite me back, I'll come back. But tomorrow, we're going to be in Asheville for a moral Monday. And y'all ought to come down the mountain and come there. They said, we come down. The next day, 10,000 people showed up. 98% white in the mountains. I'm, I'm just preaching, speaking. And, 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 and Moral Monday in the mountains of North Carolina was the only place where incumbent Tea Partiers lost the next election. They found a way to come together because we gave them space with the moral framing. Not see if it was a left framing, then that means all the people on the right ain't welcome. 
So right, you see what I'm saying? That's that's puny. That stuff comes from the 17th century in the French Revolution. The left wanted didn't want the monarchy, and the right wanted the monarchy. And whoever told you you were left? Why? You know, and it's and first of all, it's linguistically traumatic to try to call somebody wrong wrong that you just finished saying they're on the right. I mean, that's the first rule of debate is don't play to the, your adversary. So we need to unpack a lot of this language that we have we have accepted. You know, like white evangelicalism. Ain't no such thing as white evangelicalism. The first time evangelical is used in the Bible is in Luke chapter 4 where it says good news evangel to the poor. There's no such thing as an evangelical critique that does not deal with systems of extreme poverty and economic exploitation. So yes, my brother, there are, I work with the mayor in Haven. I could tell you that story. And I, I, and I believe there are a whole lot of folk that will change but they will not change through as long as only thing game in town is the partisan. The only reason, you know, the, the, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act were sponsored by Democrats and Republicans. But it was a movement in the street that forced that. It was a moral movement. You never hear Dr. King talking about Democrat and Republican. You never heard SNCC talking about Democrat and Republican. Cesar Chavez talking about Democrat. They talked about something much grander. So they were very politically involved, but they just weren't partisan. And that gives people space. If we create the right movement in the street and force the narrative, it's going to make people have to shift. And maybe only for a shining moment. But that's when America's best project, pro progress has been made. When for a moment, people become statesmen and stateswomen and not merely partisan actors. So yes, there are some already but eyes have not seen and ears have not heard what will be possible if we dare to lead the comfort of our sanctuaries and take our faith into the public square. I'm looking for another question. WWW what? BreachRepairers.org. Go there, click on Poor People's Campaign. There's a form, sign up. We have an anchor team in California that's already working um, and organizing. If you fill out the form, they'll get it to them. They'll get in contact with you. We need folk that, um, as I tell folk, the great test of a revival is what folk do afterwards. So the great test of a lecture is if, you know, you've got enough folk in here to make up that thousand. All right, so, um, so we want to see some, and if you don't want to do the arresting, there's a lot of other things, but we got to get that 1,000 for 40 days, 1,000 for 40 days, 150 a week. That's the minimum. Somebody at one state told me, Pastor, we can get 5,000, I said, get the 1,000 first. Because <laughs> we're not talking about a rally, and we're not really talking about a commemoration, we're talking about launching a movement, not ending a movement, and then those 1,000 people will become activists in their states organizing and growing the power base of the poor and the working poor and all of us together so that we can transform. And it's not quick microwave work. We're talking about generational transformation. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. That's okay. So, Reverend Barber, I'm also a Presbyterian minister. Liz is a Presbyterian, the co-chair. She's yes, a Presbyterian. Yes, exactly. Right. So, with the co-moderators of the Presbyterian Church USA, I'm presuming that you're aware that they are wanting to have the Poor People's Movement as a part of the curriculum for all uh, congregations in the Peace USA. We meet with them on November the 13th. The Christian Church Disciples of Christ is in. The United Church of Christ is in. Great. The Presbyterians are in. The Unitarians are in. Uh, one of the re rabbinical Jews groups are in. And so the reason we, choose, we chose to meet with the denominational groups, though last, is you got to build it from the bottom to hold it. And we had to make sure that people understood this wasn't us doing something for the poor but the poor leading with, you know, that's a, that's a model. And so yes, November 13th. And yeah. is there a curriculum? Is that on the website, I presume? There, we there will use? be. Right okay. now, because of the way in which, um, you know they killed Dr. King for trying to do this. So, because, he, because this kind of transformation uh, and, and power of bringing people together. So we're starting, in a little bit different way. 
our first organizing teams are by invitation only to build the anchor groups. Because the first thing we want to do is work with groups who were in totally already, didn't have to be convinced, didn't have, didn't have a lot of questions. Because some folk would get in the room and for the time they finish questioning, people won't do anything. And we needed folk who know we had to do this. And then people who wouldn't go back and say, well, if this high power person is not in, it's not going to be anything. And people who didn't, who could understand the power of 25,000 people acting simultaneously, you don't always need a big 100,000 rally, people rally. The first moral Monday was 17 people. But by the next February, we had 80,000 people in the street. You build small. So the answer is yes, um, that we will have that meeting on the 13th. And then we will let the denominational groups choose how they move from there, whether they're going to bring people together or whether they're going to choose selective churches or how, because there's certain things within the denomination. Right now, everything you need to know about the basic is on the website. If you go to www.breachrepairs or if you just go to www.poorpeoplescampaign.org, there's a whole website of information. Uh, there's a two-pager analysis of it. We are not putting out all of the strategy. Even tonight, you notice I said, gave y'all some suggestion. That ain't the whole piece, because we've got to hold it close for a minute until we get folk organized. Even with the 1,000 people, they're all going to have to be trained. It's not like you're going to just be able to show up. We're going to have to get people trained. We're ha trying to do it in a way that is, is small enough to control, but large enough to have impact. People have to be trained. I don't know if you remember back in the day, SNCC, for Freedom Summer made everybody come to Miami University in Ohio. They had to go through training because the last thing we could see, the empire and, and, color, and, and, and imperial attitudes incite violence because they use violence to oppress. They use the excuse of violence. That's why they're so scared of nonviolent direct civil action. And, and that's why, we, and when, some of what we're doing is going to break the norm. See, normally, when we get ready to pro pro protest as, as um, progressive, sometimes we accept the place they assign us. Like if they say, you can have your rally out here on this spot. Well, we're saying, uh-uh. We're saying the inside the state house belongs to us. Not a, not a spot outside the Capitol building, but Ryan's office belongs to us. But in order to do that, you've got to do it in a way that is, 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 is nonviolent. And, and as we often tell people, we never go to get arrested. We go to exercise our rights. And if you choose to want to take those rights, then we're not going to submit to that. Then you have to make the decision about whether or not you're arrested. So yes, there is the basics. Yes, more is coming. Yes, we're having a denominational meeting with leaders on November the 13th. And the United Methodists, where, where are we? We're in conversation with the, um, one of the bishops, and they are invited to that meeting. They sure are. Okay. They're invited to that meeting. Yeah. Because our bishop would love to come to that meeting. Okay. Well, if, yeah, if, yeah. and, and um, if you um, you got everything, if you in contact with me, um, I forget actually I don't have it in front of me. Who all the and we believe even more people. You know, I, I can tell you when we started Mar Monday. Let me just own this. We didn't have them plan for three years of, of uh, we, had, we said if we can go in and, and, and say something one time, you know, that's what we planned. But when we went, it, it freed people. And the next Monday was 34 people. And the next Monday was 68. And by that time, we said, wait a minute, something's happening here. And then it went from 14 weeks to 21 weeks to 30 weeks. And it went from protests to lawsuits to, and it put it all together. It went from a, it went from seven clergy to a thousand clergy. It went from 10 people to thousands, you know, and, and we didn't know at the time that there had never in the history of the United States been a thousand people arrested at a state capitol. We didn't know at the time that by the fourth week, the governor, who was an extremist, numbers had gone from 60% to 39, and he never recovered. And we never endorsed him, we never called, or, or didn't endorse him, we didn't call his name. We challenged the policies, and we found out that if you reframe the policies as moral issues, the extremists can't debate you. I mean, what are they going to stand up and say? Cutting health care is the moral thing to do. <laughs> I mean, you see, so what you do is you have to change the rules. Too often what has happened is even progressive and revolutionary type thinking people, we have accepted the language of the oppressor. 
and allowed them to set the terms of the debate. That's, Jesus never did that. Jesus never did. Jesus would even shut up sometimes just to change the terms of the debate. You know, he'd say what he had to say, and he'd say, I don't have nothing else to say to you. And, and you know, the prophets always changed the terms of the debate. Henry Thoreau changed the terms of the debate. You know, William Lord Garrison changed the terms of the debate. That's what Dr. King did. He took Southern Baptist theology about love, but he took it away from interpersonal stuff and went and said, how does this law represent the love you claim? And you change the terms. So part of the, part of the transformation of America is we have to change the debate. We have to make sure, if we don't do anything else but shift the narrative so much that never again will we have 26 presidential elections, presidential debates, Democrat, Republic, and not an hour on poverty. Think about that now. That we went through 26 debates and we didn't have one hour on power because nothing forced it. One, we didn't have one hour on ecological devastation. We didn't have one hour on, on um, uh, war economy. One, one, one um, um, news media, they said they had 200 and some odd minutes of reporting on the on the presidential election, and only 32 minutes was on substantive issues. The rest of it was on tweets and emails and innuendos. Why is that allowed? Because you, there's not a movement forcing. Remember, Lyndon Baines Johnson, the movie comes out tonight. He was not going to do the Voting Rights Act. Dr. King and white and black people did not write him another letter. They created a political atmosphere that forced him, Democrats, and Republicans to do what they didn't even want to do. And, and what has happened is the extremists took our playbook. 1973, Charles Koch said to a group, he said, we're no longer going to endorse Messiah candidates. We're going to build a movement that can punish people. Now, I don't like that language, but my grandmother taught me a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> so, you, so you learn, think about that. He said, he said, he said we're going to build a movement and we're going to go down to the states and build it from the bottom up. We're going to build it in the way we talk. We're going to build a new lingo. We're going to take over the airways and we're going to build a movement from which candidates will come out of. Yeah. Progressives decided to search for a Messiah candidate and, and put everything in electoral politics. If you lose, all the infrastructure goes away. If you win, folks say, now y'all fix it. You politicians fix it. And did not keep underneath the political partisan a movement to give folk cover, to give folk the strength, to give them the moral capacity to do it. Now, where did the Koch brothers in 1973 get the strategy, go back to the states and build from the bottom up? Dr. King's speech in 1963 when he said, go back to Alabama, mm -hmm. go back to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. He was outlining for us a state strategy. And then the Poor People's Campaign, he was outlining a fusion strategy to bring black, white, gay, straight, young, old, Muslim, Christian. It wasn't Dr. King's Poor People Campaign. There were 25 groups that were in that first meeting he had. And, and, and that's why they said, you got to go. Not because he was weak. And guess who turned on Dr. King first? The civil rights community, the unions, the clergy. One of the great things about this Poor People Campaign now is many of those same groups are saying, we're not going to make that mistake again. And that's a blessing. Because after he gave his speech at Riverside, all the groups left him. When he was doing the Poor People's Campaign, Cesar Chavez was in the room, the Jewish Federation was in the room. They were all persons and groups that were kind of fringe, not fringe and in, in, in unimportant, and they said our only survival is to come together. And the other part of the story is they killed him, but they still had that Poor People's Campaign, and you can trace about 40 policies that Trump and them are trying to turn over now 
that came out of the Poor People's Campaign that we never talk about much. So we gotta build a movement and not just have a moment. We cannot, we cannot just have electoral politics and think we can save the soul and the heart of this democracy. We must have a movement that can affect electoral politics, but is not bound by electoral politics. Okay, Bishop Baba, thank you, thank you, thank you for educating us, for challenging us, for inspiring us, and for giving us a plan for the way forward. Uh, we are really honored that you were with us this evening. Thank you for making the big journey across the continent to come and be with us. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for inspiring our nation. We need you. Thank you, thank you. Thank Can I you, tell you, you one joke? Yeah, tell us a joke. And um, first thing is, somebody said to me, Reverend Baba, but, but I, everybody doesn't want to do this. I said, I get it. So in moral movements, everybody doesn't always want to do it, but somebody has to do it. So that's what I'm saying. People that want to be in this, like somebody said, well, remember, I would be in it if you would just stop wearing that stole and stop talking about religion. Well, I love you, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> And I'm not going to ask a rabbi to do that. And I'm not going to ask even an agnostic that comes in because they believe in the con Somebody has to do the moral piece if the other piece. You cannot think of any progressive accomplishment that did not have underneath it somewhere a higher moral calling for why it should be. Now here's, now here's the joke. Y'all ain't funny in Sacramento. I know exactly why you invited me here. I saw, I came through the door, Chris, I'm gonna get you. Cause I saw all those fabulous highfalutin people that you all invite to the lectures, right? And people in the past. This is why y'all invited me. You invited me because you, you did me like a man once did his mule in Kentucky. A man had old swayback mule, Pastor Allen. You know, swayback, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> he decided to enter that mule in the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> and when he put him in, somebody said, oh, man, look, Paul, look, 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 Brother John, why would you pay all that money to enter that old swayback mule into the Kentucky Derby? Because you know, number one, he's going to lose. No chance. And you know when the gate opens, when that bell ding, rings, the thoroughbred's gonna be gone and around the track, and he'll just be walking out. <laughs> and the old man said, I know, but I kind of felt sorry for the fella. And I thought if I put him in here, the exposure might do him some good. <laughs> so thank y'all for the exposure.